very pleased to have Dr. Murad Aslan with us, uh, who is going to talk about NATO's expansion. Uh, allow me some time to uh, expand upon Dr. Murad's incredible career where he his education started from the War College in the field of management in 1991. He assumed varying tasks and appointments in the Turkish Armed Forces, and he did his program uh, uh, in his uh, International Relations Department of Middle Eastern Technical University. His PhD research was about intelligence and propaganda efforts in peace-oriented undertakings based uh, on the UN and NATO practices in Bosnia and Afghanistan. His studies are primarily on the security and defense studies, the conceptualization of power, intelligence, and propaganda practices. He had been commissioned to Iraq, Afghanistan, and Bosnia. While his primary focus has been on the Middle East, he has also monitored Afghanistan, the Balkans, the US, and China. He was a faculty member of the Hassan uh, Kalyanchu University of Turkey after teaching as a visiting uh, scholar at uh, Baskent University. He is currently a faculty member of Istanbul uh, Sabatin Zayim University and a researcher in SETA Foundation, where I had the pleasure of interacting with him in person when we were there for a series of meetings in Turkey. Uh, so Dr. Aslan is going to talk about NATO's expansion. And uh, as you all might know, uh, this was a very burning issue in the past uh, month when NATO's expansion uh, to Finland and Sweden's uh, NATO's bid to uh, expand to Finland and uh, Sweden was uh, 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 you know stopped by Turkey, uh, particularly with some of its concerns. Although that uh, ban was lifted, uh, that uh, uh, the, the obstacles were removed, uh, but we would be really interested in hearing from Dr. Dr. Aslan's. Uh, what were Turkey's main demands as we read that, uh, you know, some of their demands were with regards to the Kurdish militant groups, those were based in those countries, and uh, they also wanted to lift bans on some of the small arms sales to Turkey. And uh, in the background, there was probably also some uh, desire on part of Turkey to have some waiver on the Katsa, uh, Katsa waiver over their procurement of S-400 defense system from Russia and the purchase of uh, issue of purchase of uh, S. F-35. Uh, so Dr. Aslan, over to you. I have uh, uh, kind of, uh, you know, expanded the debate specifically from the Turkish uh, Turkey's point of view, but we would really appreciate if you touch upon these specific uh, areas that I mentioned and also what NATO's expansion in general means for Turkey as well as for the larger European security. Over to you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mrs. Tara. Uh, you know, first, I would like to present my gratitude, respect to all listeners, uh, and Pakistan is significant and special in my heart. Uh, and there are some reasons for this. Well, it's not only about culture, maybe interaction be, uh, period to my uh, professional uh, career. Uh, and this topic is really important. I, and I, I would like to thank Strategia Mr. Sultan, Mr. Haidar, and you uh, inviting me to this distinguished uh, event and address the public and also the distinguished uh, listeners, guests in here. Well, today I have prepared a presentation in an academic mood, not uh, in a popular language, not uh, with the resonating arguments of Turkey or etc. So we have to understand, in my opinion, why international organizations attempt to expand, mainly the one about security. If you just say regional organization, that means it has a sort of limitation in terms of geography or then some uh, organizations specifically delimited by the identity, either culture or religion or etc. But security organizations are uh, different. If you go to the charter of, the, uh, of NATO, well, it says Euro-Atlantic zone. That means there's a geographical designation. And in the meantime, it's about security and NATO continuously attempted to expand, but there must be reasons for this. So the question, the main question in here is twofold. Why 
security organizations expand and why states do want to be a member of such organizations because expansion does not only cover the attitude of the organization itself, but also the states as well. In this sense, there must be a conceptual discussion. And in my agenda, first, I will try to uh, visualize it. And secondly, I will just try to depict why and how NATO expands with specific terms. I will touch contemporary debates, and you have mentioned Sweden and Finland as the case studies, and later then I will conclude. Okay, what is the motivation? I mean, why security organizations try more wider than ever? If you just visit the Cold War era, it was Warsaw Pact also trying to expand it, expand itself. Well, there's an organization now currently in Central Asia, Collective Security Organization, and the attitude is, again, having more countries in Central Asia, and NATO then is not exceptional. And the motivation is really important. Well, the motivation may be justified by the concepts of international relations discipline. For instance, you can argue that it may be a balance of power uh, you know, policy. Or some others may argue that the bandwagoning of the states just to benefit from the security assurances of a structure, in this case, NATO, and also a hegemonic power may be, uh, may be the issue that must be realized in their minds. That means surging for more security. On the other hand, there is a reality if states attach themselves to any structure, that means they have to give up some sort of sovereign rights. That means, for instance, they can't act independently. They must be in a position to exchange views and sometimes act in accordance with the common will stream of the structure, that means NATO. Even though the decision-making process is based on consent, well, we know that some countries observe exactly the general mood of international politics and act accordingly. So it's not an easy decision to attach themselves to an organization. At the end of the day, they start relying on an, another structure, another organization or a state not the self-help system of the realist thinking, but they have to rely on a structure, a security structure. It's not an easy decision then. On the other hand, this argument, that means transferring sovereign rights, may be exposed to critics because, well, it doesn't mean that you hand over your sovereign rights by being a member of an organization, you can easily reject it. On the other hand, we have to go and visit the psychology of individuals, societies, and its reflection to the states. Once you bind yourself with the responsibilities of providing ground to promote the security of the overall structure, then you pledge some of your rights. So it's a question this can be discussed, uh, you know, uh, right after this conference, maybe in our minds. Another issue that must be delineated within the frame of a conceptual debate, well, neither of the overall security organizations at international level or regional level, doesn't matter, does have a dominant state. In NATO's case, it's the United States that here. And the basic reason for this may be the capacity of the state, the nuclear arsenal, maybe, or psychology. Uh, if you go to the collective security organization, other than capacity, psychology of the states, member states is important. So think that this hegemonic state somehow just you know, pull the others. 
Well, it may be another point of guarantee then. Then why do the states want to attach themselves to the structure that is under the heavy uh, check and balance system inside the security organization, which is the United States in NATO? I mean, what could be the reason? Well, one reason, well, as I said, security assurance, maybe lack of capacity, or maybe just to circulate a sort of psychological narrative to the potential threats in the neighborhood or in the perceived uh, time frame. But if you, if you just uh, review the meaning of a membership to a security organization, I think we have to be aware of some certain issues. The first thing is that once you apply for a membership and be a member of any organization, not only security ones, but almost all, you accept the norms that is independently created inside the circle. So it's the pledge of the state. Second thing, the state nominated or become a member perceives it as a structure that they are part of it, as you know, neo realists argue. But after an extent, they believe that and they are aware that they can't change it. So there's a mutual interaction of this structure and the state, as most uh, books and articles on neo realism argue. Another one is the discussion on giving up the interests of the state. Well, NATO does not mean that states will give up their interests, that's clear, but states are obliged to approach their interests in the frame of solidarity. And now the corporate debates, especially on becoming a member of NATO starts here. And I will touch it later. On the other hand, a security organization may impose their rules. If you, for instance, go through NATO's uh, modus operandi at political level, they build up what? Standardization, standardizations. So once all member states accept it, then they start checking it, sometimes send some teams if these countries obedient to the already established standards. So NATO somehow starts this standardization process and in the meantime, uh, uh, try to preserve it. So it becomes what? It becomes a unique society of uh, states with sui generi traditions. And actually, NATO achieved it right after 1949, once it had been established. Now NATO has distinct practice, distinct conceptual approach uh, to the security members and has the capacity to impose it on the member states. On the other hand, there are some problems. Just because of the dominating uh, state actor, the United States in this case, well, they can impose their modus operandi or their policies. And when there exists a consent in decision-making, sometimes just because of their capacity and pledge or grants to the overall structure, that means they can easily achieve it. In this sense, uh, NATO as a security organization must be scrutinized tending to what? Tending to also historical process. Because what makes you usually identifies who you are. I mean, it's just like genetics. NATO was established for why? For, and for what? It was right after the Second World War. There happened an ideological competition of communism and capitalism. And in the meantime, it has become 
an old and co covered competition, not only in uh, NATO's or Soviet Union's territories, but in the neighborhood too. You can easily observe what happened in Afghanistan right after 1979. If you go back, you can visit Korea as a case study. And also, uh, you can visit some regional pacts right after the Second World War, just to contain Soviet Union by the hands of the United States and NATO. So that means it was a competition that promoted the you know, institutionalization of NATO. And containment policy, even though NATO is a regional organization in Euro-Atlantic, well, containment policy pushed NATO to expand more and more, first indirectly and right after the Cold War directly. Well, I think the basic referent uh, arrangement is NATO's charter, NATO's treaty in 1949, Washington Treaty. And this treaty clearly identifies what they mean by collective security, which is the basic concept that NATO is ad admitted. And in the meantime, Article 10 is really important because Article 10 facilitates expanding this organization to the other countries. On the other hand, this willingness to expand it, well, it is somehow correlated to certain rules. And these rules, as time passes, has become more wider than ever and was institutionalized in 1995. Think that there were originally 12 countries in 1949, and now there exist 30. And we will have two more maybe in the coming year, Sweden and Finland. And they, there were eight different rounds of expansion in NATO's history. So expansion itself is a sort of a distinct field or engagement of NATO. The latest period to Sweden and England, it was the Republic of North Macedonia. And if you want to visit the contemporary debates, I believe that uh, well, North Macedonia is a very significant case that we can easily understand how a membership to the organization is a matter of bargaining. Because we know that there was a long discussion on the name of North Macedonia. It was Macedonia, later then, and as an agreement between Greece and Macedonia, it was Peron, former Yugoslavian Republic of Macedonia. And today, this name, just for the sake of being a member to NATO, Greeks pressed that they have to change their name and it's now the Republic of North Macedonia. Even though Greeks themselves did not agree on this name because there are some political disputes inside Greece. And similarly, North Macedonia does have a problem right now with Bulgaria, just because of the language. North Macedonia also wants to be a member of EU, and Bulgaria says North Macedonia must accept that their language is a derivation of Bulgarian language. As you can see, it's not only about NATO, but it's about all organizations. If you want to be a member, there starts a bargaining process for the nominated uh, states. Currently, we have five candidates. And this picture is interest interesting. Why? We have Bosnia and Herzegovina. Well, Bosnia, Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, was in deep trouble in 1990s. Just remember that period to Dayton process, Dayton agreement. And NATO and EU membership has become a sort of carrot in the way to have all parties in Bosnia and Herzegovina act accordingly and in accordance with Dayton process. That means being a member to any organization becomes a sort of promoting an idea. Uh, I was in Romania, it was two or three years ago. Uh, there was an Austrian ambassador and clearly invited Serbian 
foreign minister of then to be to have Serbia an EU member. You see, sometimes states do not want it. I mean, Serbia, for instance, is really called to be a member of EU, and it was Austrian ambassador uh, right then inviting Serbia to be a member. So you see, the dynamics sometimes change. Other than Bosnia and Herzegovina, there are two different cases really worth to mention, is Georgia and Ukraine. Well, NATO is really positive. Well, there was a discussion between Turkey and Sweden and Finland. That's clear. But NATO was really hesitant to have Ukraine and Georgia to be members of the organization. Why? That's the question. Why? Is it about the values they don't have? No, I don't think so. Now, there is a sort of different dynamic in here. If a membership of a country brings risks, risks and threats in comparison to the opportunities and advantages, after a simple calculation, NATO is hesitant, that's clear. <clears throat> and just remember that it was 2008, NATO had promised Ukraine that Ukraine will be in the agenda of NATO's membership program. Meanwhile, Western Hemisphere had promised Ukraine to be uh, actually to, to be assured of threats. Why? Because if Ukraine would hand over the nuclear weapons to Russia, and then the Western countries guaranteed security, not under the umbrella, umbrella of NATO, but it was an individual pledge of the United States and France and the other EU countries. But right after this pledge, unfortunately, and also uh, taking the 2008 pledge of NATO, Ukraine is out and now we have a war in Ukraine. And Georgia is another case today. Georgia is not in the agenda, even though it's a member, uh, it's not a member, but it's a nominated state. And now they have concerns what happens after Ukraine. But Article 10 is very clear. It requires NATO to have an open door policy to the countries in transatlantic region. So Ukraine and Georgia, this is my perception, must not be exceptional. This is what I believe. On the other hand, uh, 1995 study on NATO enlargement identifies criteria to be members of the structures, NATO. Well, it requires what? Reforms. It requires civil and democratic control over military. Cooperation, consultation, and consensus building among the members. That it's a promise, actually. And transparency in spending. These are the criteria <clears throat> identified in 1995. Once countries accept it and reform themselves, then there happens an intensified dialogue between NATO and the nominated or invited, or sometimes state may apply it, invited country, build up a map that clearly identifies the obligations of the country nominated and also commitments. And right after that, there starts a bargaining process under NATO. In this sense, any nominated country must have a functioning democracy, even though there is no democracy on the globe. There must be a market economy. Well, all states preserve their markets against foreign interventions. This is another critic to these uh, principles. Fair treatment of minorities, and, well, we have to then question what minority is because some societies are not being counted as minority. Peaceful resolution of conflicts, 
contribution or capacity to contribute to NATO, and also a democratic civil military relations. As you can see, these are the principles and criteria that is observed by NATO. Then if you go back and just check the current member states, also the nominated ones like Bosnia, Georgia, Sweden, Spain, and etc. Well, you have to question all these principles and also compare it to the actual status of the nominated countries and also existing member states. It's another issue. And now let's focus on the process. I mean, what sort of process uh, is being implemented? Well, once a state applies or once NATO invites, there starts an accession talk in Brussels. What is an accession talk? That means they start bargaining, an initial bargaining. And later then, if the state is positive, and if invited by NATO, or if this accession talk somehow facilitates the nominated member state, you know, pledges a letter of intention to NATO with clear timetables, a reformation agenda, etc. Because NATO countries does have a military and security architecture, which does have a standardized uh, you know, modus operandi, doctrine, and also uh, actions. That means the nominated country must accept all these standards. Once they achieve it, and after an inspection, now it's time to have a protocol. And now currently, Sweden and Finland sign it at the beginning of July. It was 2nd of July, I believe. I don't remember the exact date. Then all member states must start their ratification processes in their parliaments or identified institutions pending to their constitutions. Once this overall process is concluded by all member states, because decision-making process is based on consensus, then Secretary General invites the nominated state and they conclude the overall internal procedures and deposit the uh, documentations among themselves. Well, it's a long process. What I mean is that if a country is nominated, it takes at least a year to start and finish it. Well, Superior to Sweden and Finland, now we have to discuss one another thing. In what conditions NATO accepts a country to be a member state or what a candidate state wants to achieve by this membership or sometimes uh, they will have something to do right after domination and what is the agenda of this uh, nominated state? Let me just try to uh, you know, clarify it. For NATO, I think everything starts with a clear threat perception, threat assessment. Once there is a country uh, nominated to a membership, the first thing ever is usually a threat assessment. What sort of threats are mobilized if or once this country is included to the overall structure? This is the essential question at the very first day. And this threat perception is usually uh, motivated by geostrategic and geopolitical uh, requirements. Once you include a country, what sort of geostrategy must be applied? Or what geopolitical challenges will be faced? These are the questions. On the other hand, an issue for NATO is capacity and capability building. Well, capacity and capabilities, these are different things. Capacity is in the headquarters, planning, coordinating, and designating 
or directing or commanding. Capability is the numbers and sorts of assets in the inventories of the military and their ability to use it. So NATO must be, must ensure that the capacity and capability of this dominated state is worth to emulate. Because usually they are not that much developed armies and they have to expand it and improve it. That requires that defense spending. That means NATO calculates exactly the advantages and the risks. And Sweden and Finland were not exceptional for this. On the other hand, there are some arguments in the uh, academic debates why Sweden and Finland suddenly emulated, suddenly embraced by the most NATO countries. Well, it may be an EU solidarity that may be one reason, because EU solidarity in accordance with uh, Rome Treaty, Maastricht, well, they have to support each other. That's, that's uh, something a European value. And that's why most European countries supported it. On the other hand, this understanding is usually uh, based on emotions. And I personally, uh, against emotions in deciding about the faith of a state or an organization. So interests and the realities on the ground is much more important, I think. And that's why in the Swedish and Finland case, Turkish attitude was different. For the candidate state, on the other hand, well, security guarantee, balance of power, or bandwagoning, these may be the motivating concepts, though, it's usually the threats and also lacking capacity to defend themselves. These are the basic motivations. Well, again, period to Sweden and Finland, I have to remind some certain things still being discussed in academic uh, literature. And, you know, all states and security architectures must be aware of it. Well, if NATO is a collective security organization, we have to be aware of the security threats. Right after the invasion of Ukraine, Russian aggression in Ukraine, now we have understood that we have both conventionality and unconventionality. What I mean is that regular armed forces are fighting against each other on the ground and we have nuclear threats, unconventionality. It has a potential uh, arsenal that could be exploited. And this is one of the basic function of NATO deter nuclear uh, aggression, especially by the, by the capacity of the United States. But now we have reality. We have both threats in the meantime. I mean, right after the Cold War, we had forgot that unconventionality is a, is a course of action. Now, we, we are aware of this threat. Second thing, if you go through the Syrian and Libyan grounds, we have both regular and irregular warfare, which makes hybrid and proxy as the most frequent course of actions. Then a threat assessment of NATO must be based on the mixture of conventionality and, and unconventionality, regularity and irregularity with hybrid and proxy nature. Another one is expansion of security to civilian sphere. That means now threats are both symmetric and asymmetric. That means states must feel safe, not through the means of military, but sometimes in the, mean, uh, in the fields of economy, 
culture, or etc. We have new area of operations right now. It's the space, it's cyber, it's environmental concerns, it's terrorism. Well, NATO is aware of this expansion for the last two decades. On the other hand, on the other hand, sorry for that. On the other hand, NATO must do more, must do more to counter all these threat types. So NATO's expansion will not be committed to uh, assess the military oriented threat perceptions, but a mixture of civilian, military, conventional, conventional, symmetric, asymmetric, regular, irregular threat assessments. In this sense, now let me touch the changing nature of security with the words of Buzan, Berry Buzan and Brooke, deepening and widening security. And in the meantime, new units like human, society and etc. or state. Well, I categorize it as micro, mezzo and macro threats. But there's something really important currently that NATO is taking into consideration. It's the security of not human of the member states, not the societies of the member states, not the states themselves in the uh, organization, but also humanity. It's a new step that NATO must, uh, you know, take. On the other hand, humanity means the future generations. So membership is not only about uh, being a member state to the alliance, but think about the future generations and NATO must review it. And what I add as a distinct uh, discussion to the overall literature in here, and I drafted this to one of my book chapter that will be published maybe in the coming days. It's intangible, intangible threats, intangible threats. Well, finance, culture, happiness, communications, social media, access to information. These are the security concerns that individuals and societies are usually be concerned right now. So the common values of NATO must include all these new emerging concerns. This is what I believe. Right after this conceptual discussion, now let me touch to Sweden and Finland. Well, I worked with Swedish and Finland officers in Afghanistan twice, in Bosnia twice. Well, no problem. They have professional armies, uh, a very developed arsenal of military equipment and etc. But the problem in here, especially between Turkey and Sweden and Finland, it was circulated with two different dimensions. The first one was these countries' toleration of terrorist organizations, which is perceived as a threat in Turkey. I mean, PKK and FETO organization, Gulenists. And the second one, especially for Sweden, is imposed embargo on Turkey. It was 2018. Sweden just issued a sort of law, and they said Turkey is under embargo and called all EU countries to implement an embargo on Turkey. Why? Because Turkey had intervened to Syria. Well, if NATO membership is a process of bargaining, and if individual member states may demand certain privileges from the countries nominated, as we had witnessed in Greek Macedonian case, then Turkey says, well, if you want to be a member state in here, then please review your policy regarding countering terrorism. And please, you are implementing embargo on Turkey. Why? If you are to be an ally of Turkey, 
these two issues is totally against our security. The second thing, and I believe that Turkey did wrong in this field, it was what? Tur Turkey is raiding the membership of EU for five decades, maybe more, maybe six decades. And today, two EU members want to be a NATO country, and these countries are not that much warm to have Turkey a member of EU. You see, there are some critics on Turkey just because Turkey rejected Swedish and Finland's membership to NATO, even though the process is going on right now. On, but these countries rejected Turkish nomination to the EU for maybe six decades, start from 1963 and come to 2022. You see, a bargaining process is a natural discourse and process of this membership. We have to accept it. And I, I was invited to a TV broadcast in Turkey and I asked why Turkey demands only two conditions from these countries, which are solidarity in combating terrorism and also lifting the all embargo conditions on Turkey. Well, we are a, we are a EU nominated member state. So why these two countries pledge their support to Turkish EU membership? I had questioned it, but now today, uh, it's clear, it's clear that uh, Turkey accepted the membership with conditions and Turkey signed a protocol with these two countries, which is really significant. There are some issues that is hidden in the sentences in this in these protocols. The first thing, both countries accepted the Turkish demands. Second thing, for the first time, two members of the EU accepted that PYD and YPG and Gulenists are terrorist organization. These are really valuable, uh, you know, gainings of Turkey right after these protocols. And the basic critic is if these two countries will be stick to their promises right after concluding their membership to, the, to NATO. Another question I would add, if these two countries stop any resolution of NATO that will favor Turkey in future, well, I'm pessimistic. So if you just check the current status of uh, this problem, now we are bound by the Turkish uh, legislation. Right after signing this memorandum, Turkey will observe if Sweden and Finland uh, will realize the promises in the memorandum and its own Turkish grant assembly to accept the members of these countries or not, not the government, by the way, Turkish grant assembly. Why? because Turkish government now pledged their support by this memorandum with conditions, but Grand Assembly is different. We will have an election in 2023, and the composition of the parliament, the current parliament will change. We don't know who will have the majority in the parliament. So it will be another story in the coming year if the new parliament after 2023 will favor or unfavor the membership of these two countries. So, uh, concluding remarks, Mrs. Stara, uh, right after 45 minutes, NATO's expansion is a natural attitude of NATO if compared to the overall security organizations with a calculation of benefits, risks, gainings, or disadvantages, whatever. On the other hand, it's a reading of geopolitical and geostrategic uh, concerns. At the end of the day, if the country is nominated and accepted, there's a huge process of reforming 
increasing capacity, pledging promises, and relying on the security assurances. But neither of the security assurances on the globe, well, that it does have a cost. That, that's clear. So that concludes my brief and waiting for the questions. Sorry for the long, boring session. Uh, thank you, Dr. Murad, for this very, very enlightening and informative session. I personally learned a lot because uh, there is definitely more what meets the eye when we're talking about the debates, like, uh, uh, you know, specifically sitting in our part of the world when we're looking at the debates, like how uh, Sweden and Finland wanted to become part of NATO, but there were uh, blocks from the Turkish side. But definitely, I find it very enlightening the way you have explained the procedure of becoming uh, the membership procedure and uh, what criteria are there which the uh, you know the desiring countries have to meet and uh, what are the standards that they have to come up to before they become members or they are ex uh, accepted to members and i also find it very interesting the way you uh, mentioned that uh, when a country becomes part of uh, an organization they are actually exceeding to the ideology or the you know the framework of that organization and the vice versa when an organization is you know letting some countries become part of that certain organization they also have to take into consideration that country's uh, perspective on the uh, various issues that uh, can, that organization you know holds uh, uh, attaches value to so that's a very very interesting debate and thank you for enlightening myself as well as the entire audience here. Uh, we already have the two hands raised for the questions. Uh, so I'll first give a mic to Mr. Imran Abbas. Uh, Imran, please ask your question to Dr. Murad. Please be brief, introduce yourself briefly and uh, where you uh, your organization, where you belong from. Thank you. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Am I audible? Yes. 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 So I am Imran Abbas, Assistant Professor, Department of Politics and International Relations, University of Sagoda. Uh, thank you, Dr. Aslan, for, for a, such a comprehensive uh, presentation. Now, my question is that you have mentioned that NATO's uh, role and responsibilities are diversifying in the, in the coming years they are going to be. Do you think that NATO's initial commitment that stands for the continental Europe and the Atlantic community will actually be going away from the geographical regions and entering into the non-Atlantic communities more because the journal threat perception to the Atlantic community has reduced since the end of the Cold War. And all the other threat perceptions that are coming towards, potentially towards an Atlantic community is beyond. So hence, uh, NATO will be likely more engaged into beyond Atlantic community. And especially if there's a case of the European Global Gateway Project, once it gets materialized with a $300 billion investment, do you see the political community of the Europe would like NATO to take the responsibilities of securing those projects uh, in, in the region beyond? Thank you. Oh, okay, thank you so much. Uh, then let me quickly respond to this question. Well, uh, expanding the geography of NATO in responding mainly terrorism, for instance, well, Turkey has already, uh, sorry, NATO has already decided to expand the geography. Uh, NATO was in Afghanistan. And right after the latest two summits, China has become the basic concern of the United States. And now NATO is oriented to counter China in South uh, China Sea or Far East. And there are partners of NATO, like Japan, perceiving China as a threat. Well, if it's a mixture of conventionality and unconventionality, NATO will clarify an area of interest that will include, you know, uh, way, uh, away geographies. That, that's clear. Second thing, the threats are not stick to geographies anymore. Uh, I mean, a cyber threat, for instance, can easily be mobilized from a country very remote to transatlantic region. Then, not only the military capacity, like battalions or brigades, but the other capacities of NATO must engage to the newly emerging threat types, 
away from transatlantic regions. That's a reality. For the question on EU, yes, now EU started, you know, PESCO system, encouraging projects to expand and improve the defense capacity of the EU member states. There was a huge discussion on uh, EU's military uh, power, mainly, mainly encouraged by France. But I worked with the EU member states as an officer, military officer, their capacity is still lacking to build an independent military posture. That's clear. An infrastructure of NATO facilitates EU and think that almost uh, most member states with exceptions, you know, like Norway, uh, they are the member of NATO and they want to benefit from the uh, NATO's infrastructure and that's normal. I believe that this attitude will keep continue for uh, a long time. Uh, just let me remind you one thing. Germany decided to spend 100 million, uh, billion euros for military spending. It's a huge money. It's a huge money. And think that it was NATO's security guarantees and also the US, American, that they had, uh, that's why they, they had ignored, you know, defense spending up until now. Uh, NATO and EU will not be equated though, I believe that EU will keep continue to benefit. And Turkish position in here is really interesting. Turkey is a nominated to EU membership and a member of NATO, like Norway, by the way. Norway is not a nominated country or a, it's not a member state. Well, Europe somehow in future will need of Turkish military capacity. Why? Not only because of the military arsenals, think that in Europe, there's an aging population uh, and they have to invest a lot. And Turkey is just in the neighborhood and Europe may benefit it. So let's see if they will discover or not. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Murad. Uh, we next had Mr. Usman Karim's hand raised, but perhaps he has withdrawn. So I'll move on to Mr. Sikandar Azam Khan. Please introduce yourself and ask your question. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is uh, Sikandar Azam Khan, and I am uh, working as a research fellow at the uh, Baluchistan Think Tank Network. Uh, sir, my question to you is, uh, uh, what does uh, NATO expansion, expansionism will achieve? Uh, does that expansionism mean that the world will observe other major war? Because it is more uh, uh, like a security-centric uh, organization uh, than uh, flourishing the democracy all around the world. Thank you. Well, NATO membership it requires to observe democratic values, norms of the Western Hemisphere, that's clear, because it's a transatlantic uh, organization. And the achievement at the end is for sure security. But the latest speech of the General Secretary of NATO, Stoltenberg, is significant. He described NATO not only as a security provider, but also a political organization a diplomatic organization. Uh, it's important. If you add politics and diplomacy, uh, other than security, and security does not only cover military, but beyond, then, well, the coverage of NATO uh, will expand more than imagined. Second thing, maybe 20 to 30 years later, we will discuss membership to e, uh, NATO, not in the military wing, but in fight against terrorism, in fight against cyber crimes, in fight against something. So there may be a diversification in future regarding the membership and also uh, perceived threats. Let me give you an example for this. Illegal immigration is one hot topic right now especially for the countries in the 
uh, at the edge of NATO's borders, like France uh, or Morocco, uh, sorry, uh, Spain and Turkey. And illegal immigration uh, has become a sort of task for NATO in the Aegean Sea. Think that NATO must cooperate with Libya, with Morocco, with Algeria, or some other countries in the Middle East to counter this dilemma. Well, a military and security oriented engagement to this problem, well, it will not bring us a solution though. NATO will engage it. Think that not a NATO membership, but partnership will promote this capacity in future. I don't know if you are satisfied with the answer. Uh, thank, thank you for the answer, Dr. Murad. Uh, the next we have Mr. Murad. Uh, thank you so much, Ma'am Sitara Noor, and thank you, Dr. Murad, for having such an insightful presentation. Uh, sir, my question is regarding the, the Turkey foreign policy toward the Ukraine war. As uh, you know, that Turkey is basically uh, hedging a balancing wedge between uh, uh, between West and uh, Russia, uh, don't think that uh, uh, the Turkey strategy of supporting you without jeopardizing ties with Moscow will create a lot of challenges for Turkey being as a NATO member. Thank you. Uh, I don't think so. I don't think so because that's what the other actors do really want it. Ukraine wants Turkey to have a certain engagement with Russia. Americans, Europeans, they also want it. And Russia does want to have a gate just to express themselves indirectly to the Western Hemisphere. I mean, if all parties to a problem, interested parties, do want it, then why not? Second thing, Turkey's strategy in Ukraine is very clear. The first thing, Turkey is concerned with the annexation of Crimea to Russia. There is a huge Turkic population either living or deported by Stalin. So Turkey wants to see this region, Crimea, as uh, you know, an Ukrainian territory and which respects the rights of the minorities. Second, Ukraine is a state, and once you challenge the integrity of any state, either in the Black Sea or the Middle East or Balkans, doesn't matter, and this is the area of interest of Turkey, then there will be more in the coming years. If you divide Ukraine, that means expected in Moldova, in Georgia, or other states. So there's no end. Sometimes being stick to status quo is much more efficient. This is what I believe. On the other hand, there are realities on the ground. For instance, Russia is a reality in Syria. Russia is a reality in Libya. They have a military presence. And you have two options, or actually three options. You can counter Russia literally directly challenging their military presence. You can persuade them it's, it's impossible. Or you can manage the situation and by that way, at least reduce the cost to a tolerable level. This is exactly what Turkey is doing right now. Turkey is a member of Astana process and also negotiating with Russia and Ukraine. And by that way, at least keeping the costs at the least minimum level. And by that way, the gates will still uh, be open for the further engagements. Uh, it doesn't mean that Turkey and Russia will uh, you know, flirt with themselves. I mean, it's, it's, it's not the issue. Uh, an example for this, it's the Turkish drones and military equipment that augmented Ukrainian resistance at the very few months against Russians. <clears throat> if Ukrainians could not have Turkish ammunition and drones, believe in me, now we have that Russian flag in Kiev. That means there is a new uh, 
international political engagement mode. It's what? Fight and negotiate. In Syria, we had the same thing. We fought against Russians and Iranians, but we kept continue Astana process as Turkey. That's why the main mood must be understood uh, in brief. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Murat. Next, we have Mr. Imran Abbas, please. Uh, thank you, Dr. Murad. Basically, this is a question to what the Murad has just said. Uh, what do you see the future of the NATO Russia Council with regard to Ukraine or you know maintaining the uh, the, the contact zone between the Russian military and the and the NATO operated military forces? And the second question is about your comment regarding the NATO's interest in the Pacific and the South China Sea. That's very interesting. So don't think that if NATO is expanding to, to such a far region and still no, no, nothing like the geography involved, uh, that there will be time coming soon that the, the Chinese Navy is turning into a blue water Navy and reaches to the Atlantic shores. And then there will be like overall arms race and militarization at the global level be essentially dangerous concept of reducing the threats. Your comment, sir. Uh, thank you. Good questions, by the way. Really good questions. Well, NATO Russia Council is currently dead. it's not functioning. As you as you remember, Russia said, "I will not be part of this organization anymore," and now it's dead. And the latest uh, summit in Madrid clearly registered this death. Well, if this Ukraine Russia war is concluded, and if both parties agree for a different engagement in future, well, it's another thing, but currently it's that. For NATO's interest in South Asia, I believe that, well, NATO is really careful in using the words. They did not portray China as a threat, by the way, a competitor. So, as I understand from the narratives of Secretary General and also the statement after the summit, they perceive China as a potential threat, but not at the epicenter of a military engagement. On the other hand, NATO's strategy in engaging China is through the partnerships with the actors in South Asia or Southeast Asia. That's Japan, Australia, and maybe by the hands of the United States. But currently, it's not a military challenge. It's just an indirect, uh, uh, based on ideas, let me say, an indirect uh, monitoring of China. By the way, I have, to, I have to confess one thing. China is a great country. And military arsenal and capacities are significant. And I believe that Chinese strategy is based on calming down the threats, not by challenging the threats, but calming down the threats, uh, based on the principles of Deng Xiaoping. Uh, I believe that Chinese politicians find way at least to reach a consensus with NATO, the United States, uh, in future, in close future. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Murad. Uh, there are a few questions in the uh, inbox as well. I want to ask a question which is sent by Mr. Ahmed Ali. He is a failure undergraduate student of strategic studies at National Defense University, Islamabad. And uh, his question is with regards to uh, Britain and Finland are stepping up to join NATO while Ukraine has a it might not join NATO ever. What's your opinion on this? And uh, also, what do you think Russia is, how Russia is likely to react to the NATO membership of Sweden and Finland when it finally happens? Can you please repeat the first question? The first question is that as Sweden and Finland are stepping up to join NATO, whereas Ukraine has signaled that it might never join it. So mm -hmm. how does that... Uh, you know, fit in, in overall the NATO's uh, work and uh, how do you think Russia is likely to react to the NATO membership of Sweden and Finland when it finally happens? Yeah, okay. Actually, 
let me start by the second question. Russia clearly, uh, you know, stated that they're not against the membership of Sweden and Finland to NATO, but they will monitor exactly uh, what's going on in the region, in Baltic Sea, and they will react accordingly. And their main concern is, uh, the, you know, uh, stationing uh, nuclear weapons to these countries. Once NATO locates some strategic weapon weaponry to Sweden and Finland, I think Russia will respond it with a symmetric or asymmetric course of action, by the way. On the other hand, comparing Ukraine to Sweden and Finland, yes, you are right. It's a double standard and Ukraine had to be a member of NATO in 2008. Well, if NATO said, okay, the risks are higher, but we have to, we have to remember one thing. There was a pledge of the United States and France to Ukraine in 1990s, and they said, okay, if you hand over your nuclear arsenal to Russia, we pledge our support to you in terms of providing security. Then what happened? Nothing. What could be done to Ukraine was to have a bilateral agreement with Ukraine in defending its territory. I mean, Americans and France as well, because they pledged this promise, may sign a joint defense agreement with Ukraine. Because once they reject Ukrainian membership to NATO. I think it's also a vulnerability for the eastern flank of the alliance. What I mean is that today, Romania, Slovakia, Hungary, Poland is much more concerned for their security. If Ukraine could have been a member of NATO, they could feel more safe. <coughs> So it's a double standard, by the way. There could be space. Well, there is somehow 12 to 13 years period to the membership uh, nomination of Ukraine. So we could have done more for this. This is what I believe. Thank you. There is another question in the inbox, which slightly relates with the previous one. Uh, this is question is from Ms. Alina Afsil, who is the student of BSIR at Air University, Islamabad. And her question is, how is NATO still relevant today, despite the Russian invasion of Ukraine? Okay. I mean, Ukraine is not yet member of NATO. Uh, and, but perhaps it's more relevant to the security guarantees by the US, which were there, but notwithstanding that the Russian invasion has happened and uh, nothing has, you know, uh, has come as strongly, as strong reaction as it probably should have been there. So you can relate it with that perhaps even more. Okay. okay. First, NATO is still relevant to today. I mean, it's clear. Mm -hmm. Why? Because, uh, okay, I'm a bit old, sorry. I was born in 1969, and I remember 70s as a child, 80s as a youngster, and 90s, well, everything had changed. Uh, think that threats change, but security concerns expand more than ever. So organizations like NATO, organizations that guarantee securities for the members will be a must in future but in a transforming manner and transforming shape. Uh, the issue in here is if NATO-like organizations can easily comply with this transformation or not. So NATO does have an effort to transform itself. There's a transformation comment in the United States, as you know. Well, if you ask me if they are successful or not, they are at least struggling to do something but not that much successful, by the way, because uh, you have to foresee exactly what sort of threats you will face in future and be ready to counter it. Uh, and let me confess one thing. 
if you are uh, studying political science uh, as an academic, you are always behind the events and NATO is not exceptional. You must be an artist to predict exactly what could be, I mean, how could be. Uh, and NATO in this sense, try to measure by numerics exactly what sort of threats we could face and try to react, but it's still, a, you know, uh, still late for at least dreaming about it. Uh, on the other hand, if you just take the Ukraine as a case, it fits this argument. Well, for the last 20 years, nobody imagined a probable attack to a state by conventional forces of the Second World War or post-Cold War. But right period to this attack, it was the intelligence organization of the Western Hemisphere, mainly the United States, uh, alarming the bells in the capitals that Russia will attack because they had captured something. And that's why right at the beginning of this war, it was an intelligence war. Uh, well, NATO is relevant because at least they can capture this intelligence. On the other hand, they also have a deficiency in foreseeing the new modes or rediscovering the old modes in the coming days. I don't know if I could answer your question or not. Uh, thank you, Dr. Aslan. And this group is certainly not coming slow as we already have three hands raised and two questions in the inbox, which definitely uh, you know, speaks how intriguing your presentation was. Uh, so I'll first give a chance to uh, Mr. Faraz Heather to ask a question. Imran and Murat, you have had a chance earlier, so you would probably need to hold a bit. Uh, Faraz, you go first, and then I'll uh, take questions from the inbox as well. Faraz, your, your turn. Uh, yeah, uh, so uh, thank you, Dr. Murat. My question is that, do you think that NATO, as well as other similar institutions, they've been reduced somewhat to political pawns on a chessboard as opposed to the big promises um, that they were once formed with and that because of that reason um, they are brought into motion or their clauses are used somewhat selectively and it's like a two-part question so if you think that is true um, do you think the selective use of inst uh, institutions and bringing them into motion selectively based off of political objectives of course um, do you think that is problematic or it makes them seem as um, less effective or it damages their narrative that can help them get even you know larger importance in the eyes of uh, or in the eyes of different countries but also their populations That's okay all. what is missing in the chessboard is usually about psychology think that chessboard is an argument uh, proposed to tell exactly the behaviors of the state actors. And NATO is an excellent uh, instrument to play on it. Why? Because of the psychology created upon the state or the leaders. Think that uh, in this chessboard, you calculate and later then you act. And calculation is usually based on not uh, only about the capacities of the, the potential opposing actors, but also the alliances that this specific actor is part of it. So that's what NATO provides. Psychology. That means once you are a member, you benefit from this psychology that is inflicted upon the potential adversaries. Let me just give you an example on it. Turkey. Turkey is uh, a country of the Middle East, Caucasus, Balkans. Well, Ottoman Empire was a European power, not the Middle East, by the way, because the first uh, offshoot of Ottomans were in Balkans, not in the Middle East. And also Turkey does have a cultural affiliation to North Africa. If Turkey could have been a non-NATO country, I mean, not a membership to NATO, what could happen? Well, 
Turkey had problems with Syria for many years during the Cold War. Turkey received threats from Soviet Union right after the Second World War. Turkey did have threats and challenges in Caucasus. Turkey had problems with Iranians. Turkish Greek problems, well, it's worth to mention. If Turkey was out of NATO, but Greece, that means there were many escalations of NATO and Turkey. Please just remember 1974, July 20. It was Cyprus as a crisis. So what could happen to Turkey if Turkey was on the island without being a member of NATO? You see, this is what NATO provided to Turkey. And if you just check the other countries, not only Turkey, but other countries, say uh, Spain or France or others, they had the same privilege of being a member of this organization. I don't know if you are satisfied with my answer. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Murad. Uh, now I'll take a question from the inbox, which is from Mr. Hassan Ahmed, who is a research fellow at Institute of Peace and Diplomatic Studies, Islamabad. And uh, the question is, can there be an emergence of credible competitor organization to NATO in the near future? For instance, is revival of something similar to the Warsaw Pact is possible? Okay. NATO expansion uh, in transatlantic region clearly uh, eliminated this option at the Western Hemisphere because we don't have blocks in the West right now. If you ask me the same question regarding collective security organization in Central Asia, its mood separate or founding charter is different from NATO. It's much more an assurance to the Central Asian countries in fighting against radicalism or terrorism, et cetera, especially for border security. Uh, today, well, Russia may challenge NATO. Russia and China does not have any intention to build a solid military alliance to counter NATO right now, because Chinese are really smart not to build such an organization that will bind them to defend another country. So in the near future, in the midterm, if, if there is no NATO attempt uh, to speculate or provoke any group of states, say Russia and China, I don't expect it. For India, for instance, China and India does have problems right now. So I don't expect a global scale uh, organization to counter NATO. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, another question in line, I'm order of uh, the big question has appeared. This question is from Mr. Hashim Kamal. Uh, and he is asking, kindly give an insight on NATO's standardization process with an example, and how does it deserve this process? Mr. Hashim Kamal is undergraduate student of international relations at the National Defense University. Okay, thank you. NATO standardization process is technical. If you want to buy this pen, for instance, from the markets, NATO defines exactly what sort of specifications, characteristics this pen must have. You can buy from any company, but you must have this specification. And NATO does have a standardization agency. And if you want to produce this pen, you have to go there and register it with the list standards. By that way, you can sell it to NATO armies, uh, especially for ammunition, uh, weaponry. Yes, they have the standardization. But it doesn't mean that you have to buy the same instruments, same assets that any NATO countries uh, impose. On the other hand, you may purchase it, this pen. Uh, it may be against the standardization of NATO, but you can't use it in NATO operations. If you use it, well, you can then operate uh, by yourself. I mean, there will be no network. Okay. 
Sure, thank you. Now, Mr. Shayan Hassan, it's your turn. Please unmute yourself and ask your question. Shayan, are you there? Uh, yes, hello. Can yeah. you hear me? Yeah. Yes, yes, please go ahead. Yes, thank you. Uh, I'm Shayan Jami. I'm a master's student of strategic studies at Air University. Uh, sir, first of all, to Dr. Murad, uh, thank you for a very inform informative talk. Sir, uh, Putin's signaling towards you know, both Sweden and Finland has been very mixed in the past weeks and months. First, he mentioned that there might be nuclear consequences uh, if they joined NATO. But in a space of a few weeks and months, you know, he's backtracked very you know, swiftly. So, so how do we interpret this sudden shift in, uh, in his, uh, in his uh, you know, approach? And sir, also you mentioned that uh, it won't be, it will be a year before both states, you know, officially join NATO. So I assume that Article 5, which talks about collective security, of course, won't come into place before then. So, so how do you uh, see Russia's response uh, before, before they join NATO, you know? Will they go towards an offensive action, do you, do you think? Or do they have no options in the scenario? Okay. Uh, for Sweden and Finland and nuclear challenge to the alliance or to Russia, uh, it's clear that once they are a member of NATO, there will be another bargaining process uh, regarding what these two countries want to counter a Russian threat and what sort of uh, pledge they require from NATO. And believe in me, it's really a long process. Uh, there must be a long preparation and planning process for this. Uh, what I believe is that they will be really careful not to provoke Russia, but have the least adequate level of uh, measures to counter a probable uh, attack. And especially Finland is concerned for such sort of probabilities. Well, Russia, I believe, uh, cannot impede such sort of uh, intention. And there are some reasons for this. The first thing, these two countries are EU member states, and they are well aware of Maastricht agreement. It, you know, this agreement is not binding the EU member states to defend the others, though there must be a solidarity among themselves. And these two countries are part of European culture, and Russia has nothing to do with uh, threatening this, these memberships. On the other hand, once the steps taken right after the membership is perceived as a threat to Russia, I believe that there will be some counter moves. And uh, we have to be aware of the Russian vulnerabilities in the meantime. Well, uh, Russia in Ukraine lost a lot. The current prediction, the current estimates on the losses of Russians is about 50,000. This is not an exaggerated number. The human loss in Ukraine, Russian soldiers, it's about 50,000 more. The arsenal of military equipment is more than ever, and they used the equipment maybe of the Cold War years. Well, they have strategic weapons to counter a uh, NATO threat, that's clear. But these two countries may be a member and Russia thing to do to prove it by uh, for the Article Five. Yes, if these two countries become a member, and if there happens a Russian aggression, Article Five will, will be an option in NATO. But please do not forget something: for the Article Five, all member states must present their consent. Because this decision needs a consensus in all, uh, that means all NATO states must present their consent. So, well, if these two countries are under the attack of another, like Russia or another one, doesn't matter, Article 5 will be in the agenda of NATO. Uh, well, it may then have all countries at the eastern flank countering Russia. 
But this is just like, sorry for that, but a scenario of a movie. When I first observed the attack of Russians after a military exercise, I told myself watching a third class movie of Hollywood, maybe maybe broadcasted in a very uh, you know unpopular channel. Think that in this age, a country started an attack conventionally to another country. But this this is the reality right now. This is the reality. So the membership of NATO countries to NATO now uh, will require running the Article Five much more easily than peer uh, peer era. That's the reality. Thank you. Uh, so now we can go back to Mr. Imran and Murad. Imran, you go first. Uh, thank you, Sitara. Uh, Dr. Aslan, I just want to talk about the narrative building around uh, the very uh, NATO expansion. So if we go towards primarily the non-Western academic discourse, they usually tend to portray that the Ukraine war is actually blessing in disguise for the NATO, give their GDP shares to the NATO and hence the American security policy for the Atlantic region is the net beneficiary of the Ukraine war. Uh, that's my first question, if I'm allowed to have a second. Okay. Uh, if you have the follow-up connected to that, you can quickly... Uh, no, let, let, me, let me respond to the first question. Okay, sure, sure. Uh, regarding narrative building, yes. Uh, uh, for the GDP spending of NATO countries, well, most people, politicians, condemned Trump's threats. It was two, two or three years ago. And they, uh, you know, Trump had accused European countries not spending a lot, but, but, but you know, the motivation of Trump was what? Selling more weapons to Europeans. It was not about the security or armament of NATO, but selling weapons of the US companies to the Europeans because Europeans are rich, they have the money, so uh, they are ready to sell clients, clients. But it's a reality. Most countries on the European continent saves and invests rather than military spending, especially the ones which are rather tiny in terms of geographical extension. Well, we want to spend money on military. And there are some and their military posture is less uh, spending. And in the meantime, a military reformation is really important just to have NATO be ready for a military campaign. I don't want a military campaign, that's clear. I'm against the war, but well, if there's a threat, they must counter it. Uh, for the military preparedness, I believe that latest summit was a turning point because the statement after this summit clearly urged the member states to spend more and renovate themselves another time and rid of the post-Cold War mood of being, you know, uh, or feeling more secured or stabilized, etc. But now they are aware of the threats and risks right now especially the ones at the East, okay? Can I have the second opportunity, Sarah? Uh, okay, quickly go ahead, please. We have few okay. more. Uh, given that the NATO's expansion is going to be beyond the uh, European region, uh, there's a fact that the adherence to the democratic value in Europe is not practiced elsewhere. So do you see the strategic need of the NATO may be incremental? in its expansion than the adherence to the democratic values? My critique to democracy, because it's a utopia right now. Neither of the countries on the globe is the
but we must have the least values that list. Uh, but the value of these principles, adherence to democratic values, is a guarantee for NATO not to be exploited by, you know, uh, totalitarian leaders. Just remember, certain individuals challenged the European security in 1930s in Spain, maybe in Germany, etc. So think that if there exists a leader with the same intention of 30s, well, they can just create a snowball, NATO at the epicenter and running in a conflict. So these principles, uh, adherence to democratic value is somehow to protect also NATO's values and NATO's mistreatment, NATO's uh, you know, exploit, uh, probable exploitation of any member state. I don't know if I express myself. Uh, yes, uh, I was just talking about the strategic needs coming and that of the adherence of the values. The, the values itself is primarily and operational uh, oriented. So in that case, there's no chance that uh, you see that uh, either they will go for no, NATO is not only a military organization, also a political organization. If you check bodies and a political leadership driving the overall NATO, so democratic values as a political value, is Speaking part of, of this organization. I'll take a question from the inbox now. Uh, there is a question by Ms. Adila Ahmed, who is a PhD scholar at the University of Lahore. And uh, her question is that Turkey has a successful model of hedging policy to deal with the West and Russia. And what cost Turkey paid the most in the process? And uh, if the, I can relate the same similar question, somewhat similar question from Mr. Sayyid Bakar Ali Bukhari, who uh, in, in connection with the previous question said that Turkey set to sell its drone to Ukraine, which is contrary to the Russian interest. Did the Russia request to block this sale? So basically this is the both question refer to Turkey's hedging policy. How successful was that? And uh, what prices Turkey had to pay in the process? Well, uh, you know, this question itself needs another hour, by the way. But uh, there's, a, there's a new literature in Turkey right now. It's about strategic autonomy. That means you can be a member of an organization, but it doesn't mean that you will be in independent decisions to be implemented or strategic autonomy may provide you comfort to deny imposed decisions of the structures. It's a discussion. I mean, I'm not defending it, but it's a discussion. In this sense, uh, Turkey reached this understanding that means strategic autonomy uh, for the last two decades. Because for the last two decades, uh, Turkey Actually, Turkish public realized that there are some threats and challenges to the partnered nations or the nations in the alliance. A clear example is the American support to PKK, PYD in Syria. I don't know if they provide support in Iraq because they deny it, but in Syria they accept it. I think that Turkey and the United States, they are allies. Turkey supported American global war on terrorism by sending troops to Afghanistan. Turkey was an active member of NATO in Balkans. And if you just keep in mind that the regions which does have a conflict is usually in the countries with Muslim population, Turkey is a must for NATO just clearly indicate that this is not a crusader war, but 
and stabilize the world. So they have to show Turkey as a justification. But despite this fact, we have Americans providing support to PKK and also tolerating Gulen's in the United States. can agree or disagree, cooperate or confront, doesn't matter. But these parallel dilemmas must occur in the meantime. What I mean is that you can cooperate with the United States regarding Afghanistan. Just remember running Karzai airport issue, but confront in Syria. Otherwise, you will just cut with a knife and no connection. So this is the new pattern of diplomacy, I believe. You have to compartmentalize the problems and areas of cooperation, keep continuing the available ones, sometimes confront on the ground, but at the end, you have to manage all these problems and opportunities, maybe providing an opportunity for the, uh, you know, cooperation, maybe it can spill over to the other fields. So that's why Turkish strategy right now is strategic autonomy. And Turkey says, well, if my interests are satisfied and my security is assured, I'm together with you, if I perceive something opposing me, that means I will act independently. That's the philosophy. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Murat. As you mentioned, uh, I think it was an uh, important point in connection with the next question that I have received in the inbox where you said that uh, perhaps in wars with the Muslim countries, Turkey's presence is there to ensure that this is not uh, against Islam, a war against Islam or the crusaders against the Islam. But here there is a question by Mr. Jamal Nasser, uh, who is asking that, is there any possibility of Muslim military organization on lines of NATO led by Turkey and Pakistan, two military powers of the Muslim world? Well, it depends on the relations of Pakistan and NATO, because if it will be under the umbrella of NATO, that means there must be a specific partnered organization arrangement. And second thing, uh, if there exists a coalition, not alliance, in a certain or specific uh, case, why not? Uh, and uh, in Afghanistan, I remember I worked with Pakistani officers in Kabul. So it was a NATO mission, and we had uh, plenty of Pakistani officers. Uh, and we were coordinating exactly what we are doing, then why not? Yes. Last but not the least, I think Mr. Maradali, you have your second chance to ask your question. Do you still have the question or no? I had you waiting for some time because uh, there were people who were asking for the first time. Are you there? Thank you. Thank you, Sitara. Mm -hmm. I have just a very short question uh, regarding the NATO expansion. Sir, as a student of IR, I personally believe that uh, the NATO expansion is, is, is a really concerning thing that, that basically depend upon the, the future security of the Europe as a whole. Since there are two potential security equations that has been, that, that has been existing in the Europe. One is the uh, European Union led uh, the strategic compass is evolved in 2020 and the second is NATO and both basically aimed at securing the European, uh, the Europe as a whole from the threat of uh, the Russia. So my question is that don't you think that this expansion of uh, NATO uh, uh, along with this uh, strategic compass will basically uh, make the Russia more vulnerable into a the security dilemma situations and will put the region into a war theater because it needlessly provoked Russia and it also remilitarized and sharpened uh, the conflict, the outstanding conflict 
and put the regions into a more conflicting zone as well. So your take on, please. Uh, thank you. You know, EU is a distinct organization other than NATO. Most EU members are member of NATO as well. On the other hand, EU and NATO are partnered organizations. That's another uh, issue. But strategic compass is a matter of EU affairs. Well, it's clear that they have an agenda. They couldn't achieve a sui generis military formation under the EU. They had some attempts to build a joint brigade at the north uh, just to start or prove that they can achieve it. I remember the formation of German and Dutch brigade. Uh, it was 10 years ago, or maybe more. But believe in me, uh, EU could not manage this process. And now they are still discussing it, but relying on NATO. Why? That's the question. Why? The first issue, uh, there is a competition in EU. We have to accept it behind the curtains. Germany and France are still competing with each other. The EU circle process of deciding something in EU, EU Parliament, EU Commission, EU summits, EU Council, etc. So the best way, the best way for EU is to rely on NATO because it's much more institutionalized in the field of security. Uh, the capacity is really high, and EU member states are actually a member of NATO. That means they can easily check and balance the other EU member states. That's, that's clear. So I think we have to differentiate both, but perceive it as NATO's agenda, I believe. Thank you. Dr. Aslan, we I understand we are nearing the time uh, end of time for this discussion, but I think I can quickly fit in fit in one last question which I have received in the inbox. Uh, we really don't want to overtax you uh, for the time, but uh, quickly if you can respond to the question from Mr. Imran Abbas again that uh, are U.S. concerns uh, a real technical concern of Turkish uh, Turkey acquiring? Uh, S-400 system working side by side NATO standardization of weapon synchronization needs for its operation. I mean, how does Turkey's acquisition of S-400 relate with NATO's, uh, uh, you know, standardization of weapons and synchronization problems that it might arise? And uh, it's not just that cuts are, uh, is imposed on Turkey. It's yeah. operational side of the things which really needs attention as well from the Turkey side. And of course, there are US concerns also. So your quick take on that. Please. Actually, I was expecting this question earlier, but <laughs> now I found- I, I did refer to that in the beginning of the discussion and I was also hoping that this would drive in that direction, but definitely I do not want to miss out on this question. Okay, the question on S-400 is really important, yes. Turkey procured S-400. There are many answers to the question why. Uh, but Turkey did not purchase, did not purchase this system for NATO. This is one issue, should be delineated boldly. This is purely for Turkish air defense, not NATO's. Second thing, Turkey started procuring negotiations with the United States first, and Turkey did not deliver it. Okay, please, we need this air defense system, Patriots. And Americans played for time and later then denied it. There was an option in China, and the disagreement was about the technological uh, you know, uh, partnership. On the other hand, at the end of the day, when Turkey canceled the Chinese option, Russians offered the half price of patents. Half price. Well, another reason for Turkish procurement is the threats. Well, we have Iran 
with a great arsenal of rockets and missiles. We have Syria with old fashioned rockets. We have Russia at the up Northwest. Well, we just have a radar in tragic of Malatya city. Just try to detect the missiles, not to protect Turkey. And when Turkey uh, requested air defense systems against probable Syrian air strikes, they first sent Patriots to the two provinces at the south, and Americans and Germans suddenly withdrew them. Now we have Italians and they did not Spanish Patriots. That means we have to rely on another country but we don't have any asset. And once this specific country says I'm done, that means we are alone. And now think or project uh, a scenario. Iranians and Europeans or Americans or Israel or Syria fired rockets. All rockets will pass through the Turkish territory and we will just watch the traces. Well, Turkey must have a capacity then. Well, for this purpose, Turkey identified two different uh, phases. The first one was till Loramitz, which is based on producing the local air defense systems, national ones. And Turkey achieved producing, manufacturing Hisar A plus Hisar plus air defense systems for the low and medium altitude. And today, Turkey is in a phase of concluding the third phase of the project, high attitude and long range air defense system, SPAR. And either Patriots, if would have been delivered, or S-400s, they were just a measure for a transitionary phase. Well, when Turkey purchased it, there was a great reaction, but Turkey said what? First, there are many NATO member states with Russian inventory. And then Turkey may have to. Second thing, if this weapon system is a danger for F-35 that's tested, or let, uh, just send a technical team and investigate it, they said no. Third, there was a military exercise in East Mediterranean Sea. Greek S 300s was activated, and Israeli F 35s just fly above it to see if S 300, uh, you know, detects F 35 or not. You see, this is a dilemma then. Well, uh, it was an option, and Turkey had to procure one system, but it's not Turkey to procure S-400, but Turkey requested first Patriots. I believe that, uh, and by the way, uh, we have to be aware of one thing. The basic reason to deny Turkey from S-400 procurement was F-35. Uh, but please keep in mind, F-35 is not a stealth aircraft. It's stealth for the radars, but not for interception of uh, electronic messaging, not for intercepting radiation or image transferring. So I don't understand exactly why F-35 is a reason. So we will see in the coming years, maybe there will be a change as normalization proceeds. But the essential reason, in my understanding, is that the US wants to have allies that is controllable as written in their strategic concept. That's why. Thank you. And could, do you think Turkey should have, you know, demanded waiver of the CAPSA sanctions specifically when there is a precedent in case of India, where India did the same thing, but the sanctions were waived off. 
Wasn't Turkey in a position to demand the same treatment being a NATO ally? Or well, could have uh, become part of the list of, uh, the wish list could have been part of the, you know, granting membership to the Finland and Sweden. Could have, could that have been the part of the negotiation as well, this demand? Well, Katsa measures uh, is a dynamic of US politics. There's a great lobbying uh, Senate, uh, you know, congressmen, congresswomen in the United States for the benefit of Greek or Armenian or Israeli security. F-16 procurement of the last one or two years, it's, it's now uh, a project and they issued a law in the US Senate that it must be conditioned that Turkish F-16s will not violate the Greek airspace. On the other hand, the Greek airspace is not recognized by the American Foreign Ministry or Defense Ministry because uh, it's 10 miles, not six miles, and not uh, above the sea land, but beyond. You see, there are some contradictions in the US thinking if Turkey is in the hands or in the minds of the politicians. I believe that the normalization process of the United States and Turkey is totally dependent on the internal politics. And they are just waiting 2023. If there happens a government change in Turkey, I believe that they will review it because essentially they are not against Turkey, but against Erdogan. That's the essential issue. Thank you, Dr. Aslan, for a very, very interesting discussion. And uh, I think the number of questions that you have received and uh, the, the very good question, I must thank the uh, participants as well for very intriguing and uh, informed questions, which I think has played an important part in enriching the debate. And thank you for your time and thank you for sharing your insights. This was indeed a great discussion. I have personally learned a lot, and I think that's the same with the rest of the participants as well. Thank you very much once again. Uh, over to you, Dr. Athan. No, thank you. Over to coordinator Faraz. But yeah. I must thank uh, Dr. Aslan. Thank you very much for taking time out. And it was two hours and extensive engagement. Thank you very much. Thank you. I thank for you. Us, you. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I know, uh, you know, my, my, my sound is a bit boring, sorry for that. It's hot in here, but please forgive me if I did something wrong, no. but my purpose is just to express myself. Thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, it was a, a very interesting talk, uh, Dr. Murad, because like normally you don't, um, getting to hear a different perspective on NATO um, is very important because when you're learning or researching, uh, having different views and perspectives and angle is very important, we'll, you know, uh, in analyzing any institution or regional uh, politics. So I really thank you for that. Um, I think we can close now. I just have a, a few announcements, uh, just one announcement for the participants, but we can close the session uh, of the talk uh, right here. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mohad Aslan, and thank you, uh, Ms. Asadarnu. You really moderated the discussion well, and uh, it was quite interactive and useful. So thank you to you, uh, to you guys and to the participants as well. Love this. And just participants, just stay back for a second.